Okay, thank you. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm the last before lunch, so I will try not to be too long. Uh, so today it's my pleasure to talk to you about uh, digital soil mapping from territories to globe, uh, progress and challenges. And I'm going to show you uh, some examples mainly taken from the work of uh, the G Global Digital Soil Map, GLAD Soil Map Consortium that has been funded by the Studium. So may I first uh, introduce myself? Uh, I am Dominique Arwe uh, from uh, Illinois Centre Val de Loire, uh, InfoSol unit located in Orléans, and the main consortium members are <coughs> Professor Budiman Minasny from Sydney University, uh, Dr. Pierre Rudier from Landcare Research in New Zealand, uh, Dr. Laura Poggio from uh, Istrik in the Netherlands, um, the Dr. Uh, Zamir Libova from um, the U.S. Department of uh, Agriculture, and also uh, the Assistant Professor Titia Mulder from the Wageningen uh, University. And we are all working on soils and on uh, digital soil mapping. And we have also several collaborators, uh, mainly from INRAE too, Anoui Shedefold, who is uh, here, she is, uh, uh, how shall I say this, um, um, the real scientific officer of, of um, this consortium and the person who knows well the soil databases. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Olsin Burnan, who is a geostatistician, Dr. Manuel Martin, who works mainly on soil organic carbon ma mapping and modeling, and Dr. Lagashri from uh, INRAE Montpellier, who is one pioneer in digital soil mapping, I would say. And we have also some people from the BRGM, uh, BRGM in French, which is the French uh, Institute uh, for Geology, Research in Geology and Mining. So we all work on soil and on uh, lithology with several uh, technologies, but uh, the first question I would like to ask you is, have you ever heard about soils? So, uh, the point about soils is that they are very diverse. Um, they, from the field scale to the globe scale, they provide essential services. So uh, no soils, uh, no life. And this is mainly, uh, mainly because, because they are at the crossroad of um, global issues uh, such as water security in quality and quantity such as food security, sustainable energy, climate change mitigation and adaptation. Uh, and they are essential uh, to achieve um, a large number of the 17 uh, sustainable development goals. And we can manage them. We can manage them at, at different scales uh, from the field to the globe. So uh, on the left, you have the the, the, the scales, the field, farm, counties, region, continents, subcontinents, world, and on the right, the various aims that can be um, um, local managing, that like can be um, land use planning, water management, um, or uh, policy regulations at national, European, or even international uh, levels. So you have to characterize them at different scales. And many issues also, uh, sorry, I went completely wrong. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, many issues um, can and should be managed uh, at all scales. This is the case for, for greenhouse gas and climate change adaptation mitigation for food, feed and fiber production, water filtering and regulation, etc. erosion, desertification. Therefore, whatever the scale is, uh, the soil information is always essential. Therefore, you have to think globally, but you have to act at the same time, uh, you have to act locally. So this is the vision we have. Uh, the vision we have is to deliver a global and freely available final resolution grid of soil properties using digital soil mapping 
uh, technologies. But what is digital soil mapping? We call it DSM in our slang. So the basis of um, DSM is that soils and their properties are not randomly distributed over the territory. Their spatial distribution depends mainly on the climate, on uh, living organisms, especially vegetations, but uh, also animals and humans. They also depend on um, the relief, the topography, and on their apparent material, that is the lithology uh, on which the soil developed. And finally, uh, they depend also on time, that is the age they have. They are young soil, they are very old soil, etc. So this is quite an old concept because it is a concept from the, from the 40s. But nowadays what we have is that we have many special data that are now available and related to these controlling factors. So we accumulated the many, many data on soil themselves and put them in a databases and continue to collect information. We have digital soil map. We have uh, digital maps of climate. Uh, we have digital elevation models to quantify some topographic indexes. We have maps of vegetation, land use, geology, lithology, etc. And we have now also uh, sensors, uh, for instance, uh, through remote sensing data. So the basic idea is that we can use all this data to build a special prediction function. And this model is called SCORPEN uh, function because um, you take all these factors, but you'll, you also take into account the, the position uh, of the uh, geographical position of the data. So how does it work? So you've got some training data. Um, uh, that are all the point data with their uh, analysis and soil information. We may have also some conventional soil map that we have stored in our geographical information systems. Then you've got all your special ovoids. And then you're going to overlay them um, and you make a stack of your, your data at the resolution that you need or that you want. And having done this, you can run predictive models of your soil properties. Uh, most of these models use some machine learning techniques and they are sometimes complemented by geostatistics when there is a special structure in the residues. And the final input is a um, predictive map uh, of your soil property plus a map of its uncertainty or a confidence interval which is very important for uh, many reasons. So why do we want to map um, uh, uncertainty. There are at least three, three good reasons to do this. Uh, first, we should inform the decision makers about the reliability and uh, the accuracy of the product. Uh, second, uh, the soil properties will be used by many models for crop modeling, for instance, land use planning, climate change, uh, erosion, flooding risk, etc. economics even, in consideration. So they have to know how the uncertainties on the soil data input is going to propagate in their uh, final output models, errors. Ideally, what we should provide to them uh, is not a range of value, it is a probability distribution function of the values for each pixel of the, of the maps. And last but not least, if you are a soil mapper like me, uh, you can use this uncertainty map to show the policy makers and the stakeholders uh, where you need more soil data and explain why you ask for additional funding for getting this uh, data. So uh, why is GSM uh, different from uh, conventional uh, soil mapping? Uh, first, you provide quantitative predictions and uh, together with the uncertainties, I already said this, your method can be reproduced, it can be updated and automated. I mean, each new soil data you have or each new covariate co you get, you can improve or try to improve your predictions. It is cost efficient uh, compared to conventional ways. Uh, you can rank also the importance of the 
controlling factors of your soil distribution at different places and scales. And this is very important for soil science and for understanding uh, soil evolution processes. And finally, you provide um, easy to use um, data to help decision making and useful input data for modeling. Then what were the aims of our Glatzel map consortium? We want to transfer a method to achieve convergence between scales and approaches. We want to generate some um, new methods for DSM. And of course, we want to improve, to contribute to improve the accuracy of the predictions and the estimation of the uh, uncertainty. Now I will now give you some example of some issues we dealt with. Um, first thing globally, uh, act locally, then merging different predictions, testing new special covariates, deal with what we call censored data, we'll come back to this after, deal with soft or uncertain data, uh, develop methods to assess uncertainty and communicate on it, and finally, go to pure digital soil mapping to digital soil assessment of soil functions and services and forecasting some soil changes. So uh, think globally, so this is the first world map of soil organic carbon ever produced together with uncertainty all over the globe. And on the right um, bottom, you can see that you can act also locally. So you have the same kind of map on a very small region of southwest France, where you can see in red um, the soils with very high soil organic carbon content that should be uh, protected, and in, in yellow the soils where soil organic carbon content is below threshold, critical threshold, and should be increased. Now let's turn to merging, uh, merging predictions. Uh, too many products um, may become a nightmare for an uh, end user, you know. Uh, here are three maps uh, of topsoil organic carbon with different soil data, inputs, and different covariates. So one on the left has been done by INRAE at the French scale with the INRAE French data and high resolution covariates. One in the middle has been done at the EU scale with EU data and uh, less resolution uh, covariates. And the right one has been done at the global level with a very large uh, resolution covariate. So which one should I use? Uh, do they bring different information? Can we, can we merge them? So uh, the, response, uh, the response is yes. Uh, you need an independent uh, data set to calibrate your merging, and we have the chance in France to have this kind of independent data set. And here we tested different merging methods, and all the merging methods gave the same response. We increased the model efficiency. I mean the goodness of the prediction increased, simply because these maps, um, the input data and the covariates they use are capturing um, more or less different contribute <coughs> factors depending on, on the scale. Uh, what is interesting here also is that uh, you don't need a big um, number of calibration data to do this kind of merging. You can see that about 200 samples on a regular grid is enough to do this kind of merging and this is very promising for countries who don't have a lot of data yet. Now we're going to test some new emerging data as covariates. So we have now changed to a very precise remote sensing data in resolution, in frequency, and also in the number of spectral uh, bands. And here we try to predict clay content on bare soils at different depths on the whole main, mainland France. And the blue ellipses are the performance of the model without using Sentinel-2 remote sensing data. Then we added progressively more and more indexes 
of remote sensing data and the performance uh, increased as you can see with the green uh, arrows here. But note that if you use only remote sensing data, that is only the, the red parts, uh, it is less efficient. So you, you have to mix both information to, um, to get an, an improvement of, of the model. And note also that uh, the prediction is of course less good when you go deeper. This is the blue uh, array and this is classical in DSM and especially in remote sensing, of course, because you see only the surface. Here is another example of a new uh, covariate that we work that we did with BRGM. So um, we, te we wanted to test uh, airborne gamma ray uh, data on the French department. So basically, uh, basically, gamma ray uh, measures emissions of some isotopes uh, of potassium, uranium, and thorium. And you can see that when you add progressively this kind of data, the maps change, the maps improve. And especially adding gamma ray helps to better map some very clay in red and some very sandy soils in blue, mainly because the high potential uh, content, there, are, there is a high um, potential uh, um, potassium content in these minerals. So let's turn to an example about uh, testing new models. Here, here we want to uh, deal with uh, sensor data. W what is sensor data? Uh, on a large number of information, for instance, you know that the value exceeds a given value, but you don't know the real value. So this is typically the case for a large number of soil depths because you are limited by the, the length of the auger that you use to dig the soil. So you have a, a lot of values that are uh, 1.2 meters, but your soil may be even more deeper. So, so it gives you this kind of distribution, which is a um, strange, which is really bizarre, and, uh, but hopefully you have some points where you manage to dig deeper using other techniques and you know the real depths of the soil. Thus, we adapted the method from uh, medicine, uh, which is called random survival uh, forest, and we could map the probability uh, to, for each soil, for each pixel to exceed any given uh, depths uh, in, in France. So let's turn to using now um, soft data or uncertain data. So this is the case of soil uh, texture. Soil texture is a particle size uh, distribution of soil in very fine clay particles, in uh, silt particles and sand particles, and they sum to globally to 100% if you keep off the, the, the organic matter and, and the, the stones. And so you can have a laboratory, um, and they sum to 100%, yes. You can have laboratory measurement that's shown in, at the, in the up left uh, triangles, but you can have also many, many estimates uh, made in the field by a hand feel by a soil surveyor. And the soil surveyor, if he is well trained, can tell you, can estimate, um, how shall I say this, in which polygon of the right triangle uh, the soil texture has the um, most probability to be. So um, one important point is that we have much more uh, field observation than lab measurements but they are less precise, of course. And the colors in the right uh, triangles tell you how are accurate our hand-filled uh, predictions. And at the end, if you have enough data with both lab and hand-filled measurements, you can predict the particle size distribution probability density function of your soft data and use it to uh, increase the density of soil information in your learning process, but taking into account that this information is more or less uncertain. 
So let's talk about the density of uh, information now and about its effect of, uh, on uncertainty. So we took uh, a French department. Uh, well, unfortunately, it's not in the, in the Région Centre. It's close to the Région Centre. It is the Mayenne department. We choose it because it was the department where there was the highest density of soil observation. And uh, progressively, we, um, we played with the density of the training point. So progressively and randomly, we reduced or we increased the number of uh, calibration points to test our different DSM models and keeping apart uh, some uh, validation points. And we run this 100,000 times for each model. And the graphs show uh, how the mean values and the performance uh, indicators increase with the number of training points. And all the models nearly tell uh, the same thing. The same thing is that uh, you progressively reach a plateau about, at about 2,500 points. So the density of points itself is important, but at a, at a given threshold, it may be more important, less important than the choice of the location where you put your new points. So now that the graal, that's what we want to go to. So we want to go from uh, pure DSM to uh, real digital soil mapping uh, assessment using models and forecasting. And this, in this example, uh, we map the feasibility to increase soil organic carbon at a rate of four per 1,000 uh, during 20 years. And for doing that, we had to convive uh, a lot of things. We had to convert, com combine, uh, of course, a digital map of the soil organic carbon. Then we coupled the special data with soil organic carbon models, climate change models, crop models, we estimated the soil organic carbon input and by the vegetations and on roots and the turnover of organic carbon. And then we got a balance between inputs and outputs. And then we added the feasibility uh, to increase uh, new, uh, new outputs by um, changing the management. And finally, what you can map is where you'll be more or less able to increase the soil organic carbon in, in France. And you can even estimate what is the global potential of uh, French soils, uh, which is actually 1.8 per mil per year. And, and this is a very hot topic for, especially for climate change um, mitigation potential, potential of soil. So meanwhile, we did a quite a lot of review, review papers. Uh, here's just an example, when, which is a worldwide network of collaborators on digital soil mapping research since 2015. And in red are the members uh, and collaborators of the consortium, so it's not so bad. Uh, we couldn't put all the world uh, people working uh, in digital soil mapping in this map, but uh, <laughs> What is in, um, in um, green is uh, people that worked a lot with us and where we did some uh, experiments. So uh, I'm going to try to, to conclude now if I can find my paper. <laughs> so this is the kind of paper that we, we um, we produced uh, mainly review articles, but also a lot of methodological particle papers uh, testing new covariates, new DSM methods, new proxies of soil measurements, and also uh, methods of uncertainty and validation. And I would like also to finish by an, an, an advertising uh, just to show you how uh, the consortium worked well um, for the studium. We worked hard and well. So this is the number of papers acknowledging the studium. We have actually published 83 papers. Um, this, is, this is quite good. Um, nearly all are, are in the excellent uh, quartile of uh, Web of Science. 
And we have also some submitted and some in preparation, and we, we hope to reach more than 100 uh, for when. I'm going to tell you this from this date, so say this date, it will be um, a conference organized by the Studium uh, and by uh, two working groups of the International Union of Soil Science. It will be on from 7 to 9 February 2003. And uh, um, it will be very interesting, of course, to enter, it will have a perfect organization thanks to the studio. Uh, having said that, I think we opened the blue sky window for mapping the soils of the world at all scales. And I thank you all for your attention.